it was one of those moments where I didn't know how to feel. It felt like something should immediately change, but of course nothing changed. I still had to earn a living as a journalist, and I still had to get out of bed that morning and make breakfast. Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the weekly podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to day of publication. I am your host, author Sarah Nicholas, and literary agent Sarah M. Fisk. Jackson Ford is a South African author living in Vancouver. He is the author of the Frost Files series, starring the psychokinetic government agent Tegan Frost. So please welcome Jackson to the show. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. So we're going to talk about your publication journey today, and we're going to start by going back all the way to the beginning. When did you first start getting interested in writing, and then how long did it take from there before you started getting serious about pursuing publication? A uh, big gap between those two things. So I've, I've been writing um, since I was a kid, I think literally since six, seven years old, not really with the goal of, of getting anything published. I think at that stage, I was pretty much blind to even the idea of having a book out, but just because I, I loved writing and I was really, really good at it. And it was the one thing I could do better, certainly in, in my school and my friendship group than anyone else. And even when I got a little bit older and started to look at you know careers, writing fiction never occurred to me as a career. It was always, well, I like writing. What can I do with writing as a career? Well, I can be a journalist. Well, shit, I guess I'll be a journalist now. Um, so I went and I, I studied journalism, which FYI is a terrible way of learning how to be a journalist. You want to learn how to be a journalist, <laughs> you go and write journalism. Um, and then I spent, I suppose, about seven or eight years as a, a working freelancer writing for people like The Guardian and Wired Magazine and io9 and the BBC and basically anybody who would cut me a check. And then I guess I was about, I want to say 27, where I just got an idea into my head of just a story that I wanted to read. And since that story hadn't been written, I thought, well, you know, maybe this is the next logical step, having a crack at a book. And so I started writing it and I very quickly discovered that this was much, much, much better than journalism. It was much better to make mm -hmm. stuff up than, you know, not make stuff up. And although it took quite a long time for, for fiction to replace my career as a journalist, only very recently that I've, I've gone full time as an author, it was that writing that first book was just such tremendous fun. I mean, I, maybe I'm looking back at it with sort of rose tinted glasses here a little <laughs> bit. I'm sure there were parts of it that made me go, what the fuck? but for the most part, I remember just having a total blast because I had no idea what I was doing. And I wasn't even thinking about publication. I was like, let me just see if I've got it in me to finish the damn thing. Nice. So speaking of actually, can you tell us about the moment that you realized you wanted to be a published author and what you thought that that might look like for you? I mean, I was completely clueless. I knew not a single person in the publishing industry. I knew absolutely nothing about the world of agents and publishers and going on sub, any of that. I was completely clueless. But I got to the, you know, I finished the book and I put it down for six months. Um, some friends and I and my then girlfriend, now wife, were going traveling for a bit. So I just put it out of my mind for a bit. And I came back and reread it and thought, hey, you know what? I this is not bad. I can see where I need to fix it up. I think having, you know, by then like a, a decade's worth of, of journalism and working with editors had excised a lot of bad writing mm. from my level of skill already. So I think that first book was at a stage where I was able to kind of not only critically evaluate it, but able to go, okay, this is there's something here. And it was at that stage that I started thinking, well shit, what do I do with the bloody thing? Could it maybe possibly come out as a book one day? That would be pretty dope. <laughs> and so I, I kind of just went from there. I did a lot of Googling, worked out what I had to do in terms of agents and publishers, and I'm sure we'll get into the, the stories there. And I kind of just, just went from there. There was never, I have to point out, there was never like an overarching drive to be like, oh my God, I must be a published author. I, I didn't think I had the imagination for that back then, quite <laughs> frankly. So it was more just, this was a lot of fun. Wouldn't it be cool if other people could read it? Nice. You are leading me perfectly into each following <laughs> question, because the next question is, once you decide to pursue publication, how did you research how the industry works, how to query, how to find agents, all those different things? This being, shit, 2012, 2013, I went to something called the the, uh, the Writers and Artists Yearbook, which I'm sure many of your listeners will be familiar with. I don't know if it publishes anymore. I'm, I'm dating myself here. 
and you know it's it's a it's a massive massive tome with pretty much everything you could want to know about the book publishing world in there and more importantly all the contacts you could want in the book publishing world including you know hundreds and hundreds of agencies and what they were looking for at any particular time and that book was a complete godsend it was also intimidating as hell i don't <laughs> mind saying that like i was reading this going holy fuck i may have bitten off more than i could chew here but through that i kind of you know it was almost like the that kind of cliche of going through a newspaper and circling want ads when back in the days when newspapers had classified ads i'm really dating myself um <laughs> but i would you know I, I literally went through and circled the agencies who i thought might be interested and so it was literally through that. I mean, I'm sure I did plenty of Googling as well and plenty of research. I remember going on a couple of writers' forums. But that was kind of the extent of the research that I did. I was just like, well, okay, I have to send to agents. I guess I'll do that now. And so became a so went, you know, started a long, long process of of submitting to agents. And I picked 10, 10 agencies, and I sent it out to them. I, I genuinely don't recall how many responded to me, but I do know that I got a couple of full manuscript requests, mm. not quite straight away, but within a few weeks, which was great, um, including um, the Blair partnership. I know we're not allowed to talk about J.K. Rowling now, given what she's turned into, but back then this was she was still riding high off Harry Potter and she hadn't kind of ruined her sort of public image yet, and the Blair partnership was her agency. Um, and they requested a full. It didn't go anywhere. I think they decided not to pursue it. But at the time, I mean, that was a, a nice shot of confidence. It was like, holy crap, I could end up being on the same agency as J.K. Rowling. Obviously, that did not happen. And I, you know, after I'd gone through the 10 agencies and they, they'd all in one way or another said no, um, I went, well, okay, I guess I better try again then. And I cracked off a bunch more and crickets, absolutely nothing. Mm. And at this stage, I started to think, at this stage, it been about, I guess, six months after I'd started sending out to agents, and I started kind of thinking seriously about self-publishing. Not as a sort of defeatist, oh, I guess I better self-publish, and it was more like, well, okay, this agent thing isn't working really well for me, I guess. I mean, look into the self-publishing thing, and my, I have a, a writer friend in the UK called George, who is, he's a, been a long-time friend, and he took me out for a beer, and he said, stop being an idiot. <laughs> you are not ready for self-publishing he'd read he'd read the book he really enjoyed it. he was like this is good the agent is out there keep looking he gave me the kick up the ass i needed mm. and then i thought okay well let me pick i guess five or six more and let's give it a shot fuck it why not and uh, obviously between agency submission rounds i was going back and polishing the book a little further and continuing to evolve it and get it to stay get you know make it even better and in this particular agent round um within the space of a week I had three requests for representation. Mm, like wow. it was nothing, nothing, nothing. And then boom, 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 just suddenly all at once. And I was, I remember going to meet the first of the agents who wanted to represent me. And I, it is, I was living in London at the time in the UK. And I had to kind of go into a pub near the cafe she wanted to meet and kind of get a glass of water and just sit down and just calm myself the fuck down. Because I was just like, I cannot screw this up. I really cannot. I was really freaking out. And then I sat down with her at the cafe and she was lovely. And it became very clear very quickly that she was the one pitching me and not the other way around. That was a <laughs> weird situation for me to be in. I was a freelance journalist at that point. My life was pitching editors and, and you know, pitching publications to get them to pick up my shit. Now he was someone pitching me. I didn't know what to do. And I, I had a meeting with her. I had a meeting with a couple more. And then... Um, I ended up choosing uh, a guy named Ed Wilson, who works for an agency called Johnson Alcock in the UK. Ed has now been my agent for almost 10 years now, and we've done eight books together, and hopefully there's many more. So I'm, you know, there are not a lot of times in my life where I can look back and go, that was unquestionably the right decision. Well, this was unquestionably the right decision. Um, Aww, Ed is brilliant. Yeah. All right. So after you signed with Ed, what was the process like from then to sending your first book contract? Well, Ed gave me an edit of his own. He sent me back notes, which were extensive and tough and quite demanding, which I think is entirely proper and correct. Um, and so I went, right, shit, I got a lot of work to do. And I'm sick of the book by this point. I'm like, I've read this, I've read this thing 20 times. I am done with this shit. I don't want to see this thing get in my life. But of course, you know, you, you, you can't have that attitude. So I just got stuck in, mm -hmm. um, sent, sent the finished version to Ed, I think a month or two later. And he went, yeah, this is good. I think I can sell this. Let's go on sale. 
And I don't remember a huge amount of the submission period. I think we were in the process of trying to move country. We I now live in Canada, so we're in the process of trying to immigrate. immigrate. So it was kind of happening in the background. And every so often, Ed would call me with an update. And the update was always, well, they said no, they said no, they said no. And um, it was, what was it? It was April 2014. And I went back to South Africa to, to, to see family. And we're driving back from Cape Town. Um, to East London, which is a town halfway up the coast. It's about eight hours away. And as we're about to leave, Ed, I think, emails me and says, hey, Orbit Books want to talk. The, uh, the editor there, Anna Jackson, really likes really likes the book and wants to jump on a call with you and, and get the cut off your jib. So I went, all right, um, shit, okay. So we jumped back in the car, drove eight hours, and the call was that night at um, uh, my wife's parents' place. And they set me up. They've got a home business. Um, so they set me up in their office. And the lights weren't working. And I'm on the call with Anna, and it's in the dark. And the room, this is, this is sort of Africa at 5 o'clock at night. It's hot, and the room is just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And I'm in the dark, sweating bullets, trying to sound like I'm totally calm and in control. Talking to Anna about the book and where I think it placed in the market, going, please, please, please don't let me cock this up. I Like, I put down the phone. I think we spoke for about 45 minutes and I put down the phone and went, I have no idea how that went. Also, I think I'm <laughs> going to die of heat stroke. Aww. And it obviously went okay because I think a couple of weeks later we were back in Canada and Ed just emailed me and said, sit down before you read this. Um, Orbit have made an offer. They want three books. And it was just, it was one of those moments where I didn't know how to feel. It felt like there should, like something should immediately change, but of course nothing changed. I still had to earn a living as a journalist, and I still had to get out of bed that morning and make breakfast. You know, like <laughs> life did not change immediately. But it was wild. So what was wild to me, and this this sounds like I'm picking myself up, but it's it, it, <laughs> it's it, I don't know how else to present it. Was this was the first book I'd ever written? I didn't have a trunk novel. i um, certainly not at that stage. I did definitely did it later, but. And so that was a, it was a really nice boost of confidence to go, well, shit, this is the first time I'm doing this. And it seems like it's, it's got legs. And while the, that first book and that first trilogy didn't end up doing nearly as well as I'd hoped, mostly because I just don't think I was quite ready in terms of writing and I didn't really have a handle on how to create great characters back then, it, it set me on a path that I have yet to step off of. Let's put it like that. Cool. The show is called Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, and so it's time for the first cue. Can you read your successful query letter for us? Okay, so this is the letter I wrote to Ed Wilson at Johnson & Alcock. Dear Ed, I'm writing to seek representation for my first novel, Traces, a science fiction story of about 83,000 words. Traces is about a courier on a city-sized space station called Outer Earth. When a routine job goes badly wrong, the courier, Riley, discovers that she's been trans transporting evidence of a murder. As she and her crew investigate, they find themselves caught up in a deadly conspiracy. Riley will discover a dark secret from her own past, one which could destroy Outer Earth. I'm a 28-year-old journalist, and my publishing credits include The Guardian and Wired magazine, among several others. I'm originally South African, but have lived in London for the past six years. Traces is my first book, but I recently began writing short stories too, and already have four publication credits to my name. I have sent the book to a select number of agents, but I hope you will love the enclosed pages, pages enough to allow me to tell them that I found a perfect match in Johnson & Alcock. I look forward to hearing from you. Yours sincerely, Rob Buffett, which is my real name. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. So how has your experience been since signing that first book contract? Mostly really, really good. I've gotten to work with some phenomenal people, um, people who are much smarter than me who have made me look much better in public than I could ever have done myself. You know, getting to work with Anna Jackson and, and the guys at Orbit Books has just been phenomenal. I, I love all those guys. But look, being an author is incredibly tough. And my, my, first, my first trilogy, um, of which um, Traces, Trace was called Tracer when it came out, we dropped the S, was the first book. It did not do as well as expected. It did okay. It did enough for Orbit to say, hey, here's another three-book contract for some, some new shit. And one of those books was The Girl Who Could Move Shit With Her Mind, which just went nuclear. But it is, it is you know, despite the fact that obviously I'd, I'd reached a, a certain level of success in just getting a, a publisher, which felt great, it, it was still bloody hard work. And it did not come easily. And there were definitely a few times when I looked in and went, shit, did I, did I blow this? 
did I screw this up somehow? But I'm still I'm still around. Um, the fourth book in the the Froth Files series comes out a couple of days before this podcast airs, I think. So it has been for the most part phenomenal. And now the fact that I do it full time, I, I I get to sit down in the morning and make shit up. And no matter how grumpy I am when I first start, no matter how like I don't want to <laughs> do this, I am like by the time I'm finished, I'm like, all right, this is this is this is what this is what I'm meant to be doing. Like I I feel good about the work that I've done today. Yeah, I I I very much hope that I get to do this for a very very long time, and I'm very grateful that I'm in this position. Position. Nice. So you're saying that even full time writers are not immune to that early morning. I don't want to go to work feeling. <laughs> oh God, no! It's even worse because <laughs> because if I if like I could I could fudge it in the past. I could go, okay, well I'm not feeling the right now. I'll just work on my day job. I'll just I'll just do that. <laughs> For a long time, I was very fortunate that I had a I had a, an editing job that I edited an audio website, and they let me work in the afternoon, and I'd do my writing in the morning. Um, so I could just switch it around if I wasn't feeling it and do some like meaningless website analytics work, you know? <laughs> and th- that didn't require much brain power. Um, but now, now there's no excuse. It's like, well, if I don't do this, there's nothing else I can do except go and play Elden Ring, and my wife <laughs> might shout at me if I went and played Elden Ring instead of working. So. Yeah, you got to just knuckle down and do it. So yes, full-time writers definitely get those mornings. Yeah. It is time for the quick round. I call it author DNA, just classifications that we like to put writers in. Are you a pantser or a plotter? Bit of both. Do you tend to be an overwriter or an underwriter? Overwriter now, underwriter when I started. Uh, Do you tend to write better in the morning or at night? Morning, 100%. When you're studying a new project, do you typically start with a character or a plot or concept or something else first? I start with an idea. Do you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee. When writing, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? Used to be sound, then I had a head injury, now silence is what I got. Mm. When it comes to the first draft, are you more of a get it down kind of person or a get it right kind of person? Get it down. Just get it down. <laughs> what tools or software do you use to draft? I use Scrivener. Do you prefer drafting or revising more? Uh, uh, neither. <laughs> they, both, they both suck and they're both awesome. <laughs> do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? Uh, hop around usually. And final quick round question. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? Ambivert. Bit of both. All right. So we're going to talk about the second cue now. What were some of the qualms or worries that you had on your journey? And were they realized or did you overcome them or how did they shake out? Man, that is a... It's quite an interesting question, actually. I'm trying to think back to what worries I had. I didn't have any worries at first when I was first, you know, trying to find an agent and first trying to complete the the first book because because I, I I was very aware that like I knew nothing <laughs> and I knew nobody and I had very low expectations of it. It was like this is just a, a an interesting side road I'm going down. Like I've built a career as a journalist. Like if this fails, I'm good. I'll be okay. But obviously, as as you know. I started to get a little bit of interest from from agencies and I got a few requests for fulls and then those ended up coming to nothing and then I had to kind of just stay grinding on 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 submission. Obviously there were some worries there, there were some qualms there in the in the sense of well maybe I'm almost there but not quite and that's really irritating and I have no idea how to fix it. It ended up working out okay. And then of course the there are the worries when the book gets published and doesn't immediately blow the doors off the the times list and you know i'm not immediately famous overnight there there are the worries there like oh shit is this is this just gonna vanish into the ether and that worry is kind of stuck around (laughs) even even when i've actually seen sales success and seen things get picked up for tv and like and 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 stuff like that the worries persist i think they, they, they they're part of the deal unfortunately when you are when you are creative for a living and you you know, you when you make shit up for a living, there's always the worry that, well, am I A, going to run out of shit to make up, or B, going to run out of shit to make up that other people find entertaining? So <laughs> those have intensified as the years as the years have gone on. I almost prefer being very young and very oblivious. I was less successful, but it was easier. <laughs> All right. And the final cue, do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your writing process that you think is kind of different or interesting or unique? I think the only thing is I, when I'm writing a first draft, nobody knows about it. 
and certainly nobody reads it. I will not talk about it with anyone. The only exception is my wife because occasionally she helps me out in terms of problems I'm having or I'll you know, bounce solutions off her and see, see if I can kind of get a little bit of an unblock in terms of a problem. But outside of her, I simply do not talk about what I'm writing. It doesn't matter whether it's the sequel to um, an existing, a sequel in an existing series or something completely new. I just... Um, I just shut the fuck up. Mm. Um, it's, it, it is a it is a it's a suspicion of mine. It's not based on anything but a long held belief that like if I don't have anything to show for my efforts yet, I have no business talking about it. Mm. I always want to come to the table, whether that table is a publisher or one of my early readers. I always want to come to the table with something to show them and something. Yeah, complete isn't quite the right word, but something that is ready to be looked at. And to me, that I, yeah, I don't talk about it. I don't um, send it out to anybody uh, ever. And I, I'm very proud of the fact that I've stuck to that like throughout my career. Even from even when I was writing Tracer, the original book, one of the best compliments anybody ever gave me was when it was done. Um, some friends came around to my place, and we're all having dinner, and I said, "Hey guys, um, I've I've written a book. We're looking for some." people to critique it would you guys be interested and one of them turned to me and said holy shit you kept that close to your chest <laughs> um and i was like fuck yeah this is an accomplished so yeah i uh <laughs> i'm i yeah i just my my little quirk is i never tell anybody about what i'm working on mm. when you are in the lowest parts of your publishing journey whatever that may have been what kept you going and why did you stick with it so after the first trilogy didn't really hit there was my my then my editor Anna Jackson had gone on maternity leave, right, and it happened right at the time where we were negotiating for a new contract, and we weren't quite sure what the next three books were going to be. Um, even I wasn't quite sure. I had one book to offer them, but it was a standalone. So as for the next two, like because Ed was pulling for a three book contract, I didn't know what it was going to be. And so yeah, there was some low moments because I I hate uncertainty. I'm in the wrong career for it, unfortunately, but I, I, I hate uncertainty. And there was a lot of it around at that particular time. I think, I want to say 2017. Um, what got me through it was just the strong belief that if I just keep writing and keep working, then things will happen. Because ultimately, the work, and I, I've, I've kind of internalized this longer, the work is the only part of the shit that I control. Mm -hmm. I control nothing else. I don't control how well a book does. I don't control how readers receive it. All I can control is sitting my ass in the chair at eight o'clock in the morning and getting 2,000 words done. That's, that's all I can control. And I kind of really kind of had to rely on that during this particular time period. Like, all right, this is, you, you know, you're in, this, you're in this for the long haul. You've only been doing this for a few years with some success. Just keep working. You're not done yet. And it worked out really really well because one of the books that they ended up picking up was the girl who can move shit with her mind um which did well and yeah but there are going to be low moments in in your publishing career they all they always are she's even the most successful writers in the world have had incredible low moments most of which we know nothing about um and you have to have that that internal voice that goes hey just keep going just keep pushing even when shit has gone completely pear-shaped just keep pushing awesome do you feel like you made any mistakes along the way that you might want to share with listeners so maybe they don't make the same ones? Yeah, my mistake was um, not spending enough time on my characters um, with my early books. I just, at that stage, I just didn't have a sense of what made a, a memorable character or a good character. I couldn't distinguish between a character being memorable to me and a character being memorable to the reader you know stories live and die by characters you can have the coolest idea in the world and i still think the idea for my first book tracer was a pretty damn cool idea but ultimately a reader is not going to give the tiniest shit unless the characters are there to carry the idea to its logical conclusion so the one thing that i wish i'd known and that i'd encourage people to to get familiar with is what makes a compelling character there's no like set answer here. There's no well to create a compelling character just do A, B, and C. It completely depends on on the story and on the individual writer. But it's the one thing I wish I'd paid a little more attention to. It's a le it was a painful lesson to learn. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Speaking of lessons, can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons that you learned on your journey to publication? I'm gonna I'm gonna just hammer it again, just because I believe it's essential to 
creating a good creative environment for yourself, which is to not tell anybody about what you're working on. I really feel very strongly about that. A story is so fragile when it's in its first draft. And you've got this temptation, especially after you've had a great day of writing or you've written a scene you're particularly proud of, to to take it to someone and say, hey, read this, tell me what you think. And that is a recipe for disaster. Because even if they say, it's brilliant, it's fantastic, you're the greatest writer in the world, those little doubts will still creep in and you'll go back and you'll start tinkering. And before you know it, months have passed and you haven't done any work on the book. <laughs> Don't tell anybody what you're working on until it is ready to go, until you write the end. I, I really like that is the one lesson that I think a lot of writers would do well to learn. I, I genuinely believe the writers who are successful, it's one of the things that distinguishes them because as I said, they've they've consciously made this creative space for themselves that is theirs and theirs alone. It belongs to no one else until they are damn good and ready to let other people in. I call this the acknowledgements portion of the podcast. <laughs> okay. This is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. So who are some of the people who have helped you along the way and how? Jesus, how much time? How much time we got here? <laughs> this is going to be like one of those never ending acknowledgement sections in books. I'll focus on on four people, I think. And if I don't mention your name, it's not because I don't love you. I just I just don't want to bore listeners of um, this podcast to tears. Um, so the first is my wife, who is my first reader, my muse, the person who I bounce nonsensical problems problems off, who is always around to talk something through, which I do, I think, three or four times a week these days. She's very, very patient. Also, the, 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 the key to being a successful author is to marry someone who is a lot smarter than you and makes a lot more money, um, <laughs> which she does very, very well. I want to shout out my agent, Ed Wilson, who continues to just be the most brilliant advocate for my career that I could have possibly asked for. We're coming on 10 years together, and I hope we're going to do 10, 20, 30 more. Um, Ed's a gem. Anna Jackson, when I started, Anna was an editor at Orbit Books. She is now the publisher of Orbit Books. And seeing, and, and she still takes time out occasionally to edit my shit, which I think is remarkable. Um, and seeing her ascent has just been a joy to witness. Um, and I feel very lucky to have worked with Anna Jackson in her prime. I also want to shout out my friend George Kelly, um, who I hope is going to be published very soon. Uh, he's the hardest working writer I know. Like, this dude, his output is just crazy. Like, you know, we, we talk about the 10,000 hours to, to perfect your craft. He must be on 20 or 30,000 now. Um, and he gave me a kick up the ass back in the day. He's always ready to read my shit. He's always on point with his criticism. So uh, shout outs, George Kelly. I hope there are big things for you in the future. Awesome. Thank you. So you just had a book come out on Tuesday. Yep. Can you tell us about it? Oh, man. Okay, so this book is called A Shitload of Crazy Powers. It is the fourth book in the Frost Files series, uh, which is all about the adventures of Tegan Frost, a psychokinetic government agent uh, living in Los Angeles, who really wants people to leave her alone so she can open her own restaurant. The book continues the story just of the world she finds herself in and the, the crazy situation she and her crew get involved in. Each book in the series uh, functions as a standalone. You don't need to have started from the beginning uh, to get the best out of the series, although you totally should. They're great books, buy multiple copies. So if you like insane action with a lot of toilet humor and a lot of bad jokes and a lot of food porn, then The Frost Files is for you and a shitload of crazy powers is for you. Nice. Jackson, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with my listeners. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. You can find the text of Jackson's query in the show notes, along with links to find out more about him and his books. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you'd help me find new listeners by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser, telling your friends, or sharing this episode on social media. And if you're interested in supporting the show, go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. If you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. That is Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.